Engelman's photosynthesis experiment. Oh, I like this one. Um, it's a really simple experiment, but it's such a brilliant one too. He took a piece of algae and he stretched out this piece of algae, which was green, so it went through photosynthesis, and he put it across a slide, and then he took some bacteria, and the bacteria need oxygen in order to survive. And so um, he put them on in the water with the algae, and then he took a prism, and a prism breaks with light, and he put the prism across the algae. So it had like purple on one part of the algae and yellow on another part and so on. So this prism is shining different colors of light on the algae. So he's got this whole setup going on where the bacteria need oxygen, the plant is stretched out, but it's only got certain colors. So that means that he's trying to determine what colors photosynthesize best. Does red color photosynthesize best? Does green color photosynthesize best? Does yellow? I mean, the plant looks green, so you would think that green is best for photosynthesis. I mean, that makes sense to me. The plant's green, so green is the best for photosynthesis. That makes sense. But that's not exactly what he found out, which is really interesting. Green is not the best color for photosynthesis. That's not how colors work. And I'll let you write that down before we find out what colors are best for photosynthesis. So the way he figured out what color was best is the bacterias swam to the areas of the algae that was producing oxygen. Because if you think back to our equation, oxygen is a waste product of photosynthesis. So if the algae is spitting out oxygen, then that means it's doing its thing. It's photosynthesizing. So they're going to swim to the areas that have a lot of oxygen present. And if there's no oxygen, the algae is not going or the bacteria is not going to go there. So it's really kind of a brilliant thing. If there's no oxygen, there's no reason for that bacteria to go that area. So this is what it looks like. Here's our algae. Here's the spectrum of colors. And here's our little bacteria. And he found that the bacteria is clustered around the blues and the purples and the reds. There were not many bacteria at all over the greens and the yellows, which is interesting because that's the color we see when we look at a plant. But the way that colors work is that if we're looking at a plant and we see green, the, the plant is actually absorbing all of these colors except green. And the green is reflected back, and that is what hits us in the eye, and that's why we see green, is because it's reflecting that green wavelength, and that hits our eye, and that's why we see green. So this red carpet, for instance, it's absorbing all the other colors in the light spectrum except red. And then the red gets reflected back and hits our eye, and that's why we see red. Does that make sense? So my blue jeans, it's absorbing all the other colors in the light spectrum except blue. And then blue gets reflected, hits our eye, and that's why we see blue. So the reason we see green is because green is reflected. So the plant doesn't need green for photosynthesis. So that's why it reflects green black back. So it's a really amazing principle that he figured out by using this algae. Engelman placed a strand of the green alga spirogyra on a microscope slide. He added water that contained oxygen requiring bacteria. The bacteria distributed themselves randomly on the slide. Engelman placed the slide on a microscope and illuminated it using light filtered through a prism. This breaks up light into its component wavelengths. Over time, the bacteria were attracted to areas where oxygen was being produced by photosynthesis. This was primarily where violet and red wavelengths crossed the algal strand. So everything was in the purple and the blue and on the red, but hardly anything in the green and the yellow.
Now, the other thing about light is light travels in these packets, and these little packets of energy are called photons. So these photons basically hit an object and they're um, absorbed into it. So this is why like, we feel heat on our skin when we're out in the sun, or we touch an object and it feels warm, thus those little photons, those packets of energy. Different wavelengths have different amounts of energy present. Just like different sounds have different amounts of energy, a really deep sound has, it vibrates you. If you're next to a bass speaker, you can feel that vibration. And really high-pitched sounds have the ability to break glass. That's how those sound waves work. That's how those wavelengths work. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. So really short wavelengths that are packed together, they have a higher energy than those lower, longer wavelengths. And that's kind of what light is doing too. It's taking the advantage of the energy that's in the wavelengths. Visible light mainly form uh, the main form of the energy that drives photosynthesis. Small part of the spectrum. So if we look at the light spectrum, what we actually see is tiny, super tiny compared to what's actually out there. There are radio waves, ultraviolet waves, um, X rays. There is so much more that we don't see. The visible light is really a very narrow part. There's all kinds of light waves that are above and below what's actually visible. We can separate out the visible light by using a prism. So here we can see the light spectrum. Um, we've got all the way down to here to all the way up here. And what we see is this much right here. That's it. And we can separate it out into the um, visible light. But it's so much more, there's so much more than what we see with this little speck. Now, plants have chlorophyll. And chlorophyll A is the most common photosynthetic pigment. There's a chlorophyll A and a chlorophyll B, both of which are green. One of them is more of a greenish yellow, the other one's more of a greenish blue. Um, but chlorophyll absorbs 
violet, red, and kind of orange, um, and it reflects the green, which appears as green, which is why we see the green. Um, there are some accessory pigments that capture light of other wavelengths, and there are some that are going to attract pollinators like purples and yellows and reds and things like that, like in flowers to attract the pollinators. But chlorophyll A is the most common and then we have chlorophyll B as well. Then we have some other ones that are in the leaves that are yellows and reds and we see those in the fall when the chlorophyll A and the chlorophyll B die off. That's why we have colored leaves in the fall because when chlorophyll A and B go away, then the accessory pigments shine through. abundant chlorophyll A. When the chlorophyll A disassembles during fall, it reveals the accessory pigments such as the browns and the yellows and the reds, um, the oranges, and again that's why the leaves change colors in the fall. It's because now those other accessory pigments are visible. They were hidden by chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B, but now they're more visible because those pigments are gone. This is an example of the different pigments, and there are a lot of pigments over in the blue green, or sorry, blue purpley areas to capture those wavelengths. There's some over in this red area to capture those red wavelengths, and then there's no pigment in the green yellow area because those are not necessary, which is why those are reflected back for us to see. So there's pigments to capture blue, pigments to capture red, nothing for green. All right. So we did manage to get through notes. We don't have a whole lot of time to work on the osmos osmosis and diffusion paper. We will talk about the photosynthesis and cellular respiration drawing later. Questions? 